Sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation. God, God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul he fills, and every faithless murmur stills to God all praise and glory. What God's almighty power hath made, his gracious mercy keepeth. By morning glow, or evening shade, his watchful eye Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. And blessed be God's reign, now, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. with you and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now have the children's message. So the first story that we're going to hear today 
It's a story you might have heard of before in your Sunday school classes or in books that you've read that have Bible stories in it. And it's called The Story of the Golden Calf. And what happens is the Israelites are out in the wilderness and Moses has been up on the mountain for 40 days talking to God after God has given the Israelites the Ten Commandments. Now the Israelites had asked Moses to go and talk to God for them because they couldn't handle hearing God's voice. So Moses did what they wanted and went up. But when he didn't return as soon as they thought that he should have, they began to become afraid and lose faith. And they started trying to fall back into habits that they had had before they left Egypt. Now the people of Egypt uh, worshipped a whole lot of gods. And the way that they would worship these gods is they would have little figures or drawings of them. So there, were, there was a, a person that had the head of a bird and there was all kinds of different things. And there were bulls that they worshipped because bulls were signs of power and strength. And so when Moses has been gone and the people are sitting there becoming afraid, they're out in the wilderness and Moses has been gone too long, they turn to Aaron, Moses' brother, who's also their priest, and say, let us make something for us to worship so that we can have something we can see and we can look at that we can know that there is God. And so Aaron, foolishly, says, fine, give me all your gold and your earrings and everything, and the people do. And so he takes that gold and he melts it down and he puts it into the fire and puts it into a mold and out comes this golden calf, you know, a baby bull. And so the people bow down and worship that golden calf. And so whenever I'm thinking about how this applies to a story that you all can understand, I want to ask you, have you ever had something in your life that was so important to you that if you lost it, you became afraid? Um, when I was a kid, there was this pillow that I liked. And uh, I loved that thing so hard and slept with it every night that eventually it kind of turned into mush. And my mother had to sew a whole new covering around it because it was just basically crumbly pieces of foam. But I still loved that pillow and I wanted it more than anything with me or I couldn't get to sleep. My, uh, one of my friend's uh, daughters, uh, one of my dear uh, friends herself now, had a blanket that she loved. And she loved it so much that we could never wash it. And it would get to be old and, and grungy and gross. And we'd have to wait whenever she was a little bitty kid till she'd fall asleep and then carefully pull it out of her grasp and take it and put it in the washing machine and then slip it back into her grasp so that she'd never know it was gone. My brother had this toy mouse that he loved and it was called Nicky, like Mickey, but Nicky. And it had this wiry tail, which they would never make nowadays for kids because it would be dangerous. And he would sit there and twirl that tail. And the, it was covered with fabric. And he finally twirled it so hard that the fabric came off and it was just the wire left. And so one time it got lost. And oh my god, the agony. I have a niece who had a, a little pink and purple elephant. And oh my gosh, she left it one time on a, a tram in the airport. And oh Lord, until we found that thing again, the wailing and the crying. Do any of you have a lovey like that that you are attached to? Well, think of it this way. God is like that lovey. If we just remember we always have God with us, we'll never really be afraid. We can't lose God. We can't hurt God or make an ear come off of God like with our loveys. We can't love him until he's so dingy that he's, you know, too disgusting to be around. God is always with us. God is the ultimate lovey. And so it's good to put your, your love and your trust into something like that. But remember that ultimately God is with you all the time, even better than a lovey. And now we will have the readings. A reading from the book of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountains, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. 
Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent, that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read Psalm 106 in unison. Alleluia. Give, give thanks, thanks to, to the, the Lord, Lord for, for he, he is, is good. good and his mercy endures forever. Who can declare the mighty acts of the Lord or show forth all his praise? Happy are those who act with justice and always do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have for your people and visit me with your saving help. That I may the prosperity of your elect and be glad with the gladness of your people, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned as our forebears did. We have done wrong and dealt wickedly. Israel made a bull calf at Horeb and worshipped a molten image. And so they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that feeds on grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wonderful deeds in the land of Ham, and fearful things at the Red Sea. So he would have destroyed them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath from consuming them. The second lesson is a reading from the book of Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is anything, excellence, worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Once more Jesus spoke to the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. And again he, called, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent in his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, 
both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this week's readings certainly have some very tough subject matter when you look at them. First, we have the Israelites who no sooner have they received the Ten Commandments than they pull the earrings out of their ears, get Aaron, their priest, to make a mold, and attempt to return to the idol worship that their Egyptian former masters had practiced. Now, the Egyptians worship bulls, and so it's no wonder that the image of the bull occurred to the people as a symbol to be used to help them worship. The problem is, as we remember from last week, that the Israelites have just been told to worship only Yahweh and to have no graven images in their worship. It's almost as if God hasn't even finished carving the last little line into the stone tablets and ancient version of the ink isn't even dry. And here go the Israelites violating one of the big ones. Most scholars nowadays believe that this story was added into Exodus at a much later date when Israel leaders hundreds of years later, made reforms to move Israel away from polytheism, the worship of many gods, which Israel actually fell into all the time as they lived in Canaan, if you read the historical books carefully enough. Now knowing that does not change the point of the story. Too many times when the story has been told in uh, places of worship, in particular Christian places of worship, People have been led to focus on God being so angry that God is willing to wipe out all the Israelites and establish Moses as the father of a new people. But Moses wants none of that. Instead, he dares to argue with God and tries to talk God out of this act of violence and vengeance. Moses cleverly points out that if God were to destroy the Israelites now, it would make God look weak and powerless in front of the Egyptians and their gods. And the strategy worked. Now, Bible stories always say something about humanity and something about God. So notice that the outstanding thing about humans in this story is our ability to lose our nerve when asked to do what is right to try to find some way of comforting ourselves with a pale imitation of the life that God freely and abundantly offers us. And it's true, we lack the faith to trust God's promises to us all too often, and so we grab something worthless instead. We make idols of all kinds of things, even now. Now, when it comes to God, the outstanding thing that we learn about God in this story is not God's wrath. It's God's willingness to be persuaded to always forgive, to not react to betrayal with violence. And that's a hard message for some of us, too. After all, the right to respond violently out of feelings of fear is one of the idols of American life. Just one of them, but a powerful one. And then in modern industrialized countries, we know that the golden calf can stand for something else. The golden calf can also be that thing you worship that gets in the way of true relationship with God and with each other. In Judaism and theoretically in Christianity, one of the breaks placed upon rampant acquisitiveness, which is so worshiped in our society, it's the concept of resting from all labor on one day a week, the thing known as Sabbath or Shabbat in Hebrew. Rabbi Sir Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of Great Britain, 
points out in one of his books that dedicating one full day to God is the antidote to our constant need for more. Rabbi Sachs explains it this way. Sabbath is the antidote to the golden calf because it is the day we stop thinking of things and focus instead on the value of things. On Sabbath, we can't sell or buy. We can't work or pay others to work for us. It's the day dedicated to the celebration of the things that have value, but no price. Sabbath is our refuge from what has become a consumer culture. Consumerism has become the new religion. Its cathedrals are shopping centers and now online shopping. Its most heinous sin is not having this year's model. And it promises retail therapy, salvation by shopping, and remission of sins by credit card. Sabbath is precisely the opposite. The one day of seven on which we live the truth of this aphorism. Who is rich? One who rejoices in what he has. Especially in this time of anxiety, taking Sabbath time is especially vital. And holding it sacred is completely countercultural. But it reminds us of the blessings we already have and reminds us to stop being afraid and stop grasping for things to fill the emptiness inside us. Most importantly, it reminds us that God's love is steadfast and always satisfies. We're built to long for things. I'm reminded of a scene in the first Harry Potter book when Harry discovers the mirror of Erised, which shows you what you most desire. Harry, orphaned as a baby, sees his long dead parents and they're standing there with their hands on his shoulders. And this vision entices him beyond anything he's ever seen. So he visits that mirror over and over again, spending hours in front of it mesmerized. Finally, wise Professor Dumbledore finds him staring longingly at that mirror and warns him away. Dumbledore says that people have wasted away in front of that mirror, longing for what they cannot ever have. It does not do to dwell on dreams, Harry, Dumbledore chides gently, and forget to live. Dumbledore states that the happiest man in the world would see only himself just as he is in the mirror. Harry asks Dumbledore what he sees, and he says, I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. Imagine being that satisfied with what you have, and you know, who can't use a nice pair of woolen socks really when winter begins to set in? But both Rabbi Sachs and Dumbledore advocate a, a kind of state of mind, one where we don't scramble and fight and grumble, or allow grievance and discontent to take us over. Jesus has been telling us for weeks that such is the beauty of the kingdom of God. Beauty and faith we can embrace right now if we just put aside the American idols of violence, grievance, and division. Idols that allow us to be manipulated into fear, suspicion, and anger. And we can't try to cover uh, that up by making God a God of violence, grievance, and division either. Now we modern people are professionals at resisting doing the right thing. Our modern mythology has been twisted and misshapen over the years, and sometimes, like right now, all over the world, not just in America, too many leaders have gained power by simply combining opportunism made powerful by lack of knowledge with appealing to grievance. They divide us by undermining our faith in each other and in our ability to care for each other, in the faith that there is always enough. Indeed, it is grievance that drives the story we saw in Exodus. Like little children, the Israelites are ready to cast Moses aside and turn their backs on obedience to God when they are grieved by Moses' absence and by God's invisibility. They lose faith and instead try to make a God they can control, a God who reacts to insult and grievance with destruction. And grievance also drives the king's actions in our parable today. In the ancient world, status was also flaunted ostentatiously, just like now. A king who throws a banquet that no one shows up for looks weak and unpopular. And so we get this story that Matthew's audience wanted to hear. 
because they had grievances against the ruling Jewish authorities who were persecuting them. And of course they had grievances against Rome too, but that was too dangerous. So some of us want a God that smites sinners and throws people out of the banquet and leaves people, not us, mind you, but other people, to roast in hell for all eternity. I wonder, though, is that a case of making God in our own image, in the image of weak human frailty? I'm persuaded that this parable has been misused historically when it's been about who is thrown out into the outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Instead, when we focus on that, we gloss over the images of abundance and welcome that are truly the center of this story. I also think that this parable has been especially misused by some self-professed Christians who like to imagine God to be vindictive and violent to justify their own vindictiveness and violence. Some things that are often tied to a toxic hierarchical model of Christian leadership. This has become, in particular, a deeply dangerous idea where we use God as a model for our own prejudices and as an idol for them. But God's not like that. Just like with the Exodus story, we get it wrong when we emphasize the smiting over the grace. We overlook the fact that the king invites everyone in and asks only that they put on the clothing of abundance and gratitude. I wonder if a more fruitful interpretation, interpretive lens is to look at this as the mercy that God demonstrates after great provocation, just like in our reading from Exodus. The three parables we've heard in the last three weeks about Jesus' authority make it clear that those in power had rejected Jesus' invitation. But that doesn't mean they always will. Nonetheless, due to this rejection of God's abundant grace and mercy, the invitation is going to be extended then to people who powerful people usually wouldn't have associated with and even denigrated. So here's the good news. Although not good news for those who want to lord it over others. God sends Jesus not just to the powerful, but to the humble and the outcast, the prostitutes, the petty thieves stealing to survive, the tax collectors, the uneducated, the disabled, the people who the world ignored and exploited. And they come rejoicing, glad to be invited. They come and put on the garments of gratitude, repentance, and celebration. They come with their faces scrubbed clean by grace and mercy and hope. The parable says this, come as you are, put, put on the new clothing of gratitude and redemption. Once you've come into the feast, you're expected to put on the garments of love, the same characteristics that Paul lists as being necessary to faithful life, the one that we just heard in the song a few minutes ago. Whatever is true, honorable, just, and pure. That those things that lead to an internal purity in the sense of allowing love rather than condemnation or grievance to shine out of us. Come as you are, but dedicate yourself to your neighbor's well-being as much as you strive for your own. The church is supposed to be a representation of God's banquet, the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's terminology. After all, this is the community where healing can take place. Jesus' healing of people's physical ailments throughout scripture was all about restoring people to relationship with society and each other. And that is our necessary work today, as much as it was in Jesus' time. A huge barrier to that work is hardness of heart that grumbles against grace, that wants there to be losers so that we can measure ourselves against them and think ourselves winners. More often we see that in thinking about salvation as being only about where you go after you die and imagining that a whole lot of people are not going to make it, that's where we get wrong. That's where our hearts get turned around. The kingdom of heaven doesn't measure success by who's excluded. It measures success by when we all realize that God's love is like oxygen and no one can deprive another of it just by trying to breathe more. That's our wounded society talking, not God. We as the church can start to embody the kingdom of heaven rather than mirroring the wounds of our society if we become intentional about how we respond to each other and treat each other 
as we learn this new language of love and life that Jesus' gospel calls us to with love. If we start by constantly examining the way that we treat each other here in our communities of faith and out in the world and try to change the ways that we relate to each other so that we can put on those wedding garments. Come turn away from those golden calves that entice us into idolatry because Jesus shows us a better way. If we can put aside our idols and instead take hold of each other as reminders of God's presence among us right now, we truly have come in to the banquet. Amen. And now on page 10 in our service leaflets, we join together in saying the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have an end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, she is worshiped and glorified. She has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoice in the world always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let us humbly approach our God saying, remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God, our Savior, Strengthen your church to stand firm in your love. We especially pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Dion, our bishop, Leslie, our rector, and Sally, our priest associate. In our Diocese of Missouri, we pray for the people and ministry of St. Francis Episcopal Church Eureka. We pray for Alfred, their interim priest, Lori, their incoming vicar, and Rebecca, their deacon. We pray for Deaconess Ann House, for Michaeline, their director, and for their core members. In our companion, Diocese of Louis, we pray for Bitty Parish and Bexter, their priest. May we struggle not with one another, but instead struggle beside one another in the work of the gospel. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God, our Savior, you make happy those who act with justice. May the leaders and people of the nations dedicate themselves to pure and honorable dealings. Let your justice reign on this earth. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God, our Savior, you are good to us. You have blessed us with a rich creation and a beautiful planet for our home. May we cherish the gifts you have given us. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God, our Savior, deliver our community from worry. Make us a people of prayer, a congregation who intercedes for our neighbors. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help.
heal the sick, do mighty acts in the lives of the downcast. We especially pray for Claude Harper, Ann Allen Hacker, Cameron Major, Sarah, Nate Michaelis, Nina Barnes, Kenny Harper, Hetty Frankenfield, and Jim Duncan. We also pray for those impacted by the Western wildfires. With thankful hearts, trusting in your mercy, we make our requests known to you. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God our Savior, your mercy endures forever. We pray for all those who have died due to COVID-19. May those who have died glory in your inheritance and feast at your heavenly banquet for all eternity. Remember us with favor, O Lord. Visit us with your saving help. God of unchangeable power, when you fashioned the world, the morning stars sang together and the host of heaven shouted for joy. Open our eyes to the wonders of creation and teach us to use all things for good to the honor of your glorious name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Beloveds, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share with each other a sign of Christ's peace. Well, good morning again, and thank you for being here with us at St. Martin's Episcopal Church. Um, if you are visiting, please comment in the comments section and let us know that you're here. Um, you can also email communications at stmartinschurch.org and uh, let us know that you visited or else uh, check in on our website. There's a place there where you can do that. Um, I have a few announcements that I need to make for the good of the order. First of all, for our uh, members, third quarter giving statements should have arrived in your mailboxes by this time. I'm going to ask that you uh, look them over and uh, see uh, uh, where you are. Uh, if you're able to make an additional gift to the church right now, it would really help as we're looking at uh, doing some things to keep adapting to this time of COVID. But nonetheless, we're grateful for all of you who have contributed to our church. Um, you can also give online. We, are, uh, we have now become a, a nonprofit organization by Facebook standards, which are pretty darn high. And so you can give to us on Facebook as well as um, through buttons that we have available on our website. A couple of things. Next Sunday, we will have a special visitor here, the bishop. The new Bishop of Missouri, Bishop Dion Johnson, will be our celebrant and preacher in his annual visitation of St. Martin's, and it'll be his first since he was installed as our bishop this summer. Now, we're going to have a special coffee hour immediately after that on Zoom, and I'd like to have as many of us be there to welcome him and ask him questions as we can. So um, please be looking in the beacon next week um, for a link to that Zoom meeting so that we can all welcome him and let him know that uh, we're grateful that he has come with us. And then at the end of the month, on October 31st, which is a Saturday, 
At 11 a.m., Bishop Johnson will also be here for a special worship service, which is the celebration of new ministry, as I am being installed as the rector rather than just the priest in charge here. And that's going to be a wonderful time, and I'm really looking forward to it. Please be looking for more information about how this service is going to be broadcast in the days ahead as I work with uh, the diocese to make sure that it ends up being all the places it needs to be. Um, I want to refer you to the beacon. There's many important um, announcements in there, and um, most of them are brand new. Um, there is one thing I wanted to point out to you. Um, first of all, um, Denise's music notes are especially interesting this week. But also, as you know, we sponsor um, scout troops here at St. Martin's, and it's one of uh, the coolest things, I think. And so one of our... Um, e uh, scouts is working for his Eagle Scout project. He's collecting masks for patients and families at uh, SSM and at Barnes Hospital. And so um, there's a uh, great big uh, container that is just inside the doors um, of the church. And if you have any brand new masks that you're willing to donate, either the paper ones or homemade ones or cotton ones, whatever it is, as long as they're clean and unused, if you would, uh, over the next week, deposit those in that box, bring them on up to church and put them out there. They will then go to uh, people who need to use them all the time as they're in the hospital or as they're going in and out visiting their loved ones. So um, if you could remember to do that, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, are there any birthdays or anniversaries this week for us? Okay, oh, really? Okay. So let's see, Jay and Gina Slobodian, and Gina was one of our readers today, are celebrating their 29th wedding anniversary. What day is it, Gina? It's on Monday, tomorrow. On Monday, tomorrow, 29 years, congratulations. All right, I'm gonna go disinfect my hands. All righty, i use this then. There we go. Would you like a blessing? All righty. Come on up. And we're going through to uh, include Jay in this, even though he's not with us right now. Would you all raise your hands of blessing? as we bless Jay and Gina and give gratitude for another year of marriage, for their example that they are to us of love and devotion and steadfastness and faith. All the greatest things of the kingdom of heaven are represented in their union and we give thanks for them and ask that God blesses them. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and Jay and may you have many, many more years of love, happiness, and peace. Amen. Congratulations. All right. I know there have been a few birthdays, so I just want to shout out Bob Ecker. Uh, I think Linda Hines had a birthday this week. I can't think of anybody else. Any other uh, people showing up? Rody? Tom, 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 who? Tom Anderson. Tom Anderson? Okay, wonderful. Who? Kim's father, Don Thunder. Oh, Kim's father, Don Thunder. Excellent. All right, well, uh, for all of you that have had birthdays this week, please uh, accept this blessing. Look with favor, O oh God, upon all these beloveds as they begin another year. We give thanks for their presence in our lives, and we ask that you continue to bless them and protect them to help them to grow deeper in love, knowledge, and faithfulness to you and their we give thanks for their gifts that they give to us in each and every day. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you as you celebrate your birthdays. Amen. Okay. So, at this point, we normally have communion. But as you know, due to COVID, we no longer can do that right now safely. So instead, on page 14 in our service leaflet, we have a prayer for spiritual communion that we say together. Following that, we then say together the prayer attributed to St. Francis, the peace prayer. So if you would please join me on page 14. 
in union, O Lord, with the faithful of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated. We desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. We present to you our souls and bodies with the earnest wish that we may always be united to you. And since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves with you and embrace you with all the love of our souls. Let nothing ever separate you from us. May we live in you and may you live in us, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. And now let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Go in peace to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, and follow the one who is your Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, and Advocate be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 482, Lord of All Hopefulness. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.